Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Hasaina Tabasum. Warm welcome to you in Spring STM Lecture Series 2021. For today's lecture, our speaker is an eminent scientist and industry expert, Dr. Aisha Mujib, Chairwoman of Wimpower Pakistan. Dr. Mujib is affiliated with Manchester Biogel as a scientific advisor and its shareholder. For sure, it is her tremendous achievement in her translational research career. She has obtained exciting academic career alongside her research activities. She also found her teaching experience from reputable institutions, including Chinese Academy of Sciences, Beijing, China, the National University of Science and Technology, Islamabad, Pakistan, and the University of Manchester, Manchester, UK. Currently, Dr. Mojib is also a scientific reviewer of HEC Technology Transfer Support Fund. Let's welcome Chairwoman of Empower Pakistan, Dr. Aisha Mojib Saiba for her lecture. Over to you, dear madam. Thank you so much, Dr. Tabassum, for the very kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, today, I will talk about, uh, before I start, let me start screen sharing first and then we can continue with my PowerPoint. All right, so today we talk about uh, research networks that are now being developed to be able to maximize uh, impact of research at academic centers in particular. So my topic today is industry meets academia since I've actually been uh, part of uh, academia for over 10 years and I'm also uh, working as a scientific advisor at Manchester Biogel. So the, the plan of uh, industry and academia is obviously to closely identify innovation gaps in order to develop new therapies, right? So in order for us to do that, we actually have to adopt a new attitude. We need to understand that actually industry and academia both have the same goals in mind, which is obviously to improve and innovate people's lives today, right? But we need to understand that the road to improving translation is actually the only way forward. So here, um, I'm just gonna describe the relationship, the strong relationship between industry and academia, which is basically the academic interests lie at the cutting edge of technology, which we all know about. Uh, they create and innovate and further inspire technologies. Whereas the industry perspective is to number one, create, right, gain a competitive market. Also, in order to commercialize faster, they work very, very hard. And as we all know that industry is very, very market oriented. So we need to understand the B2B of the business. Right, so before I start my presentation, I just want to uh, go through my research journey. Obviously, I will describe my PhD work uh, that was conducted at University of Manchester under the supervision of Professor Aileen Miller and Professor Alberto Sayani. And uh, this further led to the development of a spin-off company called Manchester Biogel, which is up and running. It's been over five years now. I will also share some of my uh, research experiences as a postdoc in China. I was working at Peking University as well as the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, had an amazing time in China. And also furthermore, I will highlight some of my synergistic activities that I'm involved in. So this is something that uh, I will share with you today. I think Dr. Tabassum has already given a very uh, kind introduction, so I will skip this slide. I will start off with uh, focusing on my PhD research work, which was on tailoring self-assembled octapeptide scaffolds for in vitro chondrocyte culture. Now, what we did here is if you're a material scientist, you would understand the term self-assembly. Now, self-assembly is a basically the spontaneous organization of biomolecules. Now, whether they may be lipids, carbohydrates, or peptides, but what they do is they, they form well-defined architectures, for example, nanofibers or mesh of fibers, nanotubes, et cetera, in, under uh, environmental conditions such as pH, time, temperature, or enzyme, 
right? So we played with a library of uh, octapeptides. Uh, from, a, from a library of octapeptides, we selected uh, amino acids, which were actually hydrophobic as well as hydrophilic in nature. And the octapeptide that we developed was actually synthesized in the lab. So this is back in 2007, right? So we designed the hydrogel. Um, we, we had to establish uh, protocols. Uh, the hydrogel morphology was actually studied using FTIR, TEM, and cryo-SCM. Rheological studies were actually conducted to assess the mechanical strength of these gels in vitro. Then we moved on to uh, analyzing the 2D, 3D cell culture uh, of these gels in vitro. So we used bovine chondrocytes on these scaffolds. I'm going to explain uh, the term 2D and 3D in case uh, nobody really understands, but it's a 2D culture is basically when cells are in, encapsulated, um, sorry, 3D cell culture is when cells are encapsulated within the hydrogel, whereas 2D is when cells are actually placed on top of the hydrogel. So what that provides is a difference in mechanical strength. Cell culture analysis was conducted. And so in the next slides, I'm just gonna share some of my work that was uh, conducted at Manchester uh, during my last year of PhD when we were winding up. And uh, what we realized over these years was that um, we were able to actually culture cells within 3D up to 56 days which is in vitro, uh, which is actually fantastic. And uh, approximately above 90% of the cells were alive. Now these micrographs here uh, show actually li living cells in green, okay? And uh, you can see the cell morphology. Uh, we expected chondrocytes to retain a rounded morphology and the cells were able to retain their rounded morphology. Um, and the idea was to create an artificial ECM, right? Extracellular matrix, which is actually very essential for tissue engineering applications of uh, cartilage. So what we assessed was whether the cells were producing collagen type one or collagen type two. And what we realized from these micrographs was that basically at the end of day 25, um, chondrocytes had actually deposited a lot of collagen type 2, which is very, very typical of uh, chondrocytes, which meant that the, the hydrogels were providing the, the mechanical strength to these cells in order to uh, produce their own ECM. So the results were quite hopeful. Also, uh, virological studies that were conducted revealed that uh, there was a tremendous increase in mechanical strength after the ECM was deposited within these gels. And so we took this work forward. We developed a lot of protocols uh, in order to test them as injectable system, as sprayable systems, um, and just for subcutaneous uh, uh, implantation. And so taking these ideas forward, taking this work forward, uh, Professor Aileen Miller and Professor Alberto Sayani, they set up a company called Manchester Biogel. And um, I was given the honor of actually uh, participating uh, and setting up the, the, the labs at the Biohub in Alderley Park. And also, um, I'm currently the scientific advisor at Manchester Biogel. Now, just to give you uh, an overview, now why this is all so important, why is research so important? It's because it provides us with an opportunity to actually conduct translational medicine, right? And so with Manchester Biogel, uh, we felt that uh, the peptide hydrogels that we uh, sort of uh, developed at University of Manchester were actually not only stable in vitro, but they were also stable in vivo, right? And so um, the team at Manchester Biogel has, is internationally recognized and it combines complementary research expertise uh, to deliver a unique innovative translational solution, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Currently, uh, the need 
uh, currently, I think the, uh, the plan is to offer a cost-effective means of healthcare delivery. So uh, the applications I will discuss later. So it's the, the idea is to close gap between what we know and what we research. I think that sort of is very, very important when you're considering, uh, when you're considering industry and academia relationships. Now, benefits of research into clinical medicine. That means that we are trying to find medical solutions from bench to bedside, right? That's the approach that we're trying to develop. Now, with the advent of technology, of course, uh, it opens up new avenues, uh, which give rise to new therapies, new technologies, et cetera. Some of the, the applications that are being used for this peptide technology platform include 3D cell culturing. You've got regenerative medicine, uh, in vitro organ models, uh, which we're working on in collaboration with other universities, for example, UCL. You've got uh, vaccine development, drug delivery, and biological delivery. So this is what we're doing at Manchester Biogel. Again, some of the attributes which I'd like to highlight before I move on to my other research works is that these peptide hydrogels are actually animal free, they're reproducible, they're definitely biocompatible, ready to use, which means that you can just open up the pack and start using these hydrogels. Now they can be used as printable, injectable and sprayable materials. Um, of course, the journey was not easy. It's been very, very uh, exciting, but also very, very difficult because for any startup to, to reach a certain uh, point, of course, it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of sleepless nights. So um, the plan is obviously shown here, which I will uh, discuss very briefly. And the reason is because we're trying to highlight um, how industry academia linkages can actually form. So starting off with the marketing material, promotional branding, that uh, goes hand in hand with what the work, uh, what type of work is being conducted. So SOPs were formed, uh, the, the setup was actually moved from University of Manchester to the Biohub at Alderley Park which is actually a very nice science park. And so from there, uh, that's where the production unit is and that's where their sales are made from. We started off with small distributions. Uh, there was an EU launch, there was a USA launch, and there was um, a launch uh, also in the ROW, uh, which demo the, the idea was basically to demonstrate, disseminate, and educate people about this new peptide technology platform. Okay, moving forward, um, I'd like to congratulate uh, Professor Aileen Miller, who's actually just been appointed Associate Dean for Innovation and Business Engagement at University of Manchester. We're actually currently in the, in the process of writing a book chapter together on peptide bio-nanomaterials from design to application, where we will discuss more about the importance of industry and academia linkages and how we can actually expedite the process of, of uh, forming a product at university and taking it to market. Right, just acknowledgements. If you'd like to know more about their work, uh, please visit uh, the website Polymers and Peptides Research Group. Also, if you'd like to know more about Manchester Biogel, here's the web website link. So feel free to browse whenever you can. And if you have any further questions, please get back to me. All right, so... Um, here I will describe uh, the work that was actually conducted in China as a postdoc. And uh, Professor Ge uh, is actually currently working at the College of Engineering and they develop uh, biomaterials for cartilage uh, engineering uh, using biochemical and biophysical cues, which actually affect the internal structure and the cell phenotypes in 3D in vitro uh, application. So I'm just gonna describe one of the projects that I was involved in. Uh, I spent two years at Peking University uh, and I learned actually a lot. And so the, 
the project that I was working on initially was on biomaterials decorated with RGD peptide. So my work, my expertise basically lie between the my biomaterial and uh, cell interface, right? So we developed um, a peptide sequence that we added to uh, our polymer hydrogel in order to investigate the effect of tailoring RGD concentration right, on ECM production. Again, ECM production is actually very, very important, which we monitor. And the reason is because we want the cells to produce the correct ECM, right? Extracellular matrix is basically uh, tissue of the cell. So we understand that if the correct ECM is being produced, that means the cells are happy within the hydrogel, they, uh, they are mechanically stable, and so they can be used as implants. So here we categorized our scaffold, and here is a micrograph showing uh, PEG hydrogels, which is uh, a polymer. And so we, we added the RGD sequence uh, and the sequence is actually given in the legend in the caption below. And what we realized from these uh, results was that by adding RGD to the system, we were actually able to control uh, ECM production within these PEG hydrogels. And also the cells that were present in 3D within these macroporous hydrogels were stable. And so we carried out different types of tests in order to really understand what's going on within these 3D structures. And so here are different micrographs which are showing, uh, I think the cells in, um, the nuclei of the cells in blue because of DAPI. And you've got these elongated structures and these rounded structures which are actually cell aggregates. So the cells were stained in red. And from these uh, micrographs, we then further on studied the morphology of cell aggregates. And we realized that the chondrocytes that were used were able to retain their rounded morphology. And that's what we were expecting. Um, Alcine blue staining was conducted to, uh, to understand the deposition of ECM. So ECM actually, of course, is a cocktail of biological molecules. For example, you've got peptides, you've got carbohydrates, you've got lipids, you've got the cytoskeleton. So what we were trying to assess was that yes, the cells are uh, retaining the rounded morphology, which means that they would be depositing the correct ECM, which would be full of collagen type two, which is typical, and GAG, GAG, which are, which are actually uh, proteoglycans. In other, in layman terms, carbohydrates. So there was a lot of GAG deposition within these cell aggregates, and we've actually published uh, numerous papers together and if you need uh, more info about the work that was conducted, uh, please go through this list and uh, feel free to contact me if you have further queries. Right, so during my stay at uh, Peking University, uh, I, we applied for a, for a grant, which, which was the Sino-Swiss Science and Technology Cooperation Exchange Award grant. And uh, I was lucky that I was uh, offered a position at uh, Professor Marzi Zunobi Wong's research group at EDH Zurich. It was a very nice place. People were very friendly. And the work that was carried out was actually on, um, on hip uh, replacement joints of, of uh, human beings, obviously, who went through hip flap um, chondra, uh, chondral uh, lesions. And so uh, the work that was conducted is, of course, confidential. Uh, but we managed to actually publish one paper together. So. Um, if you want to go through that paper, we have described it here, uh, the last one. All right, moving forward. At the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, we worked on injectable hexapeptide hydrogels for localized chemotherapy in order to prevent breast cancer recurrence. Now, the, the system that was developed was actually very, very simple. It was just using a hydrophobic uh, peptide system, 
where we used doxorubicin to actually interact with the nanofibers of these um, peptide system. The work was actually published back in uh, late 2018 in ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces. Just to highlight uh, some of the work uh, on the hydrogel peptide system in particular, um, I'd just like to go through this schematic very, very quickly. Uh, and here it's uh, the peptide that was used was hexapeptide containing uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acids. For example, phenylalanine, uh, you have, uh, you've got lysine and you've got glutamic acid, which self-assembled, right, and formed nanofibers. Now, in the process uh, of adding doxorubicin, we realized that the mesh of fibers actually increased in uh, density. And so we realized over, over time that these uh, fibers became denser. And so we wanted to study the interaction between doxorubicin and our peptide system further. Uh, we carried out several in vitro experiments, but here I'm just gonna focus on the in vivo work that was conducted um, the in vitro work was quite successful. Uh, the, the system was highly stable. So in vivo, we, uh, we actually uh, loaded the hydrogel into nude mice at, uh, at uh, day nine, which is actually shown here. We injected the hydrogel with doxorubicin uh, subcutaneously. And uh, from these, uh, these micrographs, you can see by day nine, day 18, day 27, there was actually a reduction in the size of uh, breast tumor in, um, in nude mice at day 27. So from these, uh, from these graphs, you can actually evaluate uh, the effect of the peptide plus dox um, integration into uh, the animal, actually into subcutaneously into the tumor site. And so uh, we actually have the control group. We, ha we just used plain peptide. We injected uh, with docs. Obviously, there was a lot of leakage because it's a solution. However, when, uh, when the doxorubicin was encapsulated within the peptide hydrogel, you can see that there was an actual reduction in tumor volume. It's actually shown in figure D over here. Furthermore, we uh, we also uh, affected the uh, we also checked the the efficacy using hydrogel localized chemotherapy again in uh, breast cancer model. We extracted or excised the tumor from nude mice in order to evaluate what happens at uh, day 31. And uh, from this image C, you can actually uh, you can observe that there's actually a reduction in um, in tumor size at uh, day 31. Uh, the work again has been published. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask more about the system and how the work was conducted. Um, again, what we realized reduced tremendously in comparison. And also uh, we evaluated that this peptide hydrogel can actually be used as a stable drug delivery system in particular for doxorubicin. We've not actually uh, tested it on uh, any other drug as yet, but with doxorubicin, it worked wonders. Um, at the Nano Center, I was also involved in different uh, projects, obviously uh, mostly in uh, drug delivery systems, uh, evaluating their stability and understanding their behavior in vitro. So I guess uh, that's about it from uh, my end with regards to understanding the importance of uh, industry and academia relationships. I like this session to be an interactive session since we don't have a lot of uh, speakers online at the moment. So we can have an interactive session where I'd like to know more of your views, what you think of how the industry can actually help academia uh, to expedite uh, commercialization further. I would uh, then like to talk about uh, We Empower Pakistan as 
an organization which is obviously uh, currently working in uh, Pakistan as well as China in the U.S. So uh, let's stop here first and let's see if we can uh, have an interactive Q&A with regards to my current research topic. Over to you, Dr. Tabassum. Thank you so much, Dr. Aisha Mujib. And uh, if anyone have questions, please ask. That is a very interesting topic and that is closely related with the uh, real world science. So please ask if you have any question. I would like to ask a question regarding uh, the last slide that's being shown over here. Uh, I want to ask that uh, the size of the tumor was uh, decreased after the chemotherapy. So were there any uh, observed side effects to the chemotherapy? Yeah, that's actually a very good question, Faiza. So uh, the dose of doxorubicin that we were using uh, was actually very, very safe. So there were no side effects, fortunately. And we also conducted MR MRI where we, we uh, assessed where these nanoparticles were actually moving. So they were in the kidney and they were in the spleen, but they were removed from the system within uh, 10 days. So there were actually no side effects as such. The dose that we were using was very, very safe. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So anyone else? If you have question, please ask. Anything related to uh, uh, building uh, industry academia relationships? Or, you know, we can have an interactive session where we can discuss how we can, maybe some of you have an idea where you can, uh, you know, you would want to take a product forward, but you don't know how to, or, you know, you're still contemplating maybe. Dr. Tabassam, what okay. about you? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a very nice question. So definitely we will, uh, we will do more uh, contribution for uh, academia to industry. That is quite important recently in Pakistan, inshallah. So next, uh, I think we should move forward to next topic. Yeah, if any I would just like to uh, highlight, uh, obviously, We Empower Pakistan, uh, which is a nonprofit organization. And uh, what we are trying to do here is actually build a very strong consortium of uh, like-minded women uh, who are striving to achieve excellence professionally, right, in uh, STEM, uh, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, the platform of young women uh, studying or working not only in China or Pakistan, actually, we're going global. And what we're trying to do is not only catalyze change, but actually promote and support uh, what young women are achieving in the arena of science and technology. So this is what we're trying to do uh, at We Empower Pakistan. And um, recently, actually last year, we conducted a, a research conference at the Institute of Chemistry, the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. And uh, the response was actually fantastic. And what we realized was that there is actually a dire need of uh, having such platforms where actually women can express, they can uh, contribute, and they can uh, they can showcase their work. Uh, the The conference was actually a huge success, where we try to bridge gaps between educational research and commercialization. We we engaged in interactive sessions where we sort of. Uh, understood the importance of commercialization and the need for educational research and bridging gaps in educational research. So I would uh, highly recommend uh, ladies, young ladies, professionals, educationalists to actually join this network and please support in, um, in um, highlighting other, other uh, scientific avenues of where uh, young women are actually playing a very, very integral role. So thank you very much and uh, very happy to actually speak today 
during this uh, this presentation i realized actually that uh, by by showcasing your research journey you might actually inspire other people or you can actually help other people so the only reason for me to actually present my work was so that others actually understand that my expertise lie in peptide technology and uh, biomaterial interface so if you have any questions if you like to approach me with regards to uh, research uh, you have a research proposal in mind please feel free to contact me thank you very much thank you so much uh, if anyone have question please ask if anyone needs some support related research writing paper writing report writing or some proposal writing patent writing you can contact us so thank you so much uh, if you don't have any question we will wind up our session here thank you so much uh, dr aisha mujib for your time and for very nice talk so i hope uh, our audience get benefit from your talk and for from your tremendous research and academia journey thank you so much thank you so much dr tabassum for hosting this session uh again good luck to everybody thank you very much